Hi everybody, I'm James, Vice Chairman of ASMA, and today I'm joined by fellow ASMA members, Kieran and Elaine, uh, been invited along by Practice Index to cover the topic of collating your year-end information for your accountant. So I'm conscious that those watching this will have different accounting records. Some may use manual records, others may have bookkeeping software, others may have migrated onto cloud accounting software in the last few years. So each is going to have a different method of passing information to your accountant. So Kieran and Elaine, should we start with that and run through the differences between the manual bookkeeping and, um, and cloud accounting side of things? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, I can I can take the manual records if you like, James. Um, you know, essentially it is what it says is, you know, you can picture a, a big box of records coming in, but it's it's important to include, you know, everything that's needed in there. And I think the main things are, you know, bank statements covering the full year uh, up to your year end, but also we probably recommend including, you know, perhaps a month or two following the year end just to pick up any sort of post year end transactions. Um, other things, making sure your NHS statements, quarterly reconciliation statements, and all those things are included. Um, you know, various other things, payroll records, um, and also what's really useful for us, and I know we'll come on to it a bit later, is debtors and creditors. So that's what people owe you and um, you owe other people. So for, for work done before the year end, which you're not collecting the money until after the year end and vice versa for payment. So for manual records, that, that's probably the main things really. And there'll be a few similar themes as we go through on the other types of records. But yeah, so Elaine, on, on to the other ones. Absolutely. Um, in terms of either the cloud-based or even just the computerized, pack computerized packages, um, it's very similar to what Kieran's saying. Bank statements are the be-all and end-all. We'd need them for every um, job that we do, whether it's manual or computerized. And again, it's good to get them for a couple of months post year end. When you are using an accounting package, I would say one of the most important things is that your bank does reconcile. So by that, I mean that you've put on all your transactions that have happened in the year and that your balance on your system agrees to the balance on the bank statement, plus or minus any outstanding items. And the health board statements, they're also imperative to receive to allow us to get cracking on with our job. But there's, I would say there's not much difference between having the manual records and the computerized package, really, because we do tend to need the same information. Cloud-based is um, definitely the way it's moving. Um, and when we can touch dig digital does go live, that is what we, it will have to be. Um, and I think cloud-based certainly makes it a lot easier because things like invoices can all be scanned on and it means that you're not needing to keep screeds and screeds of paper. I don't know, what do you think about that, Kieran or James? Yeah, I think I think the the fact that these cloud packages, you know, such as Zero or, or QuickBooks or any others that that you know practice managers or practices might like, um, you know, they are really useful. They've got tools to be able to just forward on emails of invoices, and they automatically upload and can be allocated to transactions. And I guess you know, from our point of view as accountants, that makes it really, really, really useful because you, you know you can picture big legal legal expenses um you know costs are in year most of the time accounts will ask for what those are so if they're already uploaded then you know it saves us asking the question and makes our, our life much much easier and we can just sort of get on with it really um especially so, so, yeah. last year when you know when we were in positions where we weren't able to visit clients for much of the year with lockdown and so on cloud accounting made a big difference we could just log in um, look at the records that were there and like you say if, if invoices are also scanned some people do some people don't but when they are scanned on there as well it saves a lot of questions going back to the client as to you know what period did this invoice cover and so on if it's there um, we don't need to ask the question so it takes a bit of effort in the first place to scan the invoice on but the reward is it's there for permanent record then and um, the next topic really so Kieran and, and, and Delaney you both mentioned it is what we call as accountants cut off um, so not everything happens in year, if, and I'll take 31st of March of the year end as an example, not all of the income and expenses will happen exactly before 31st of March, so you might have paid items early, which we call prepayments, um, you might be waiting for income, for example the quaff, which then we bring in as a debtor, there'll be expense invoices that get paid afterwards, which we call creditors and accruals, um, what methods can uh, practice managers and the bookkeepers at GP practices use to make sure that the cutoff is accurate and save our accountants asking lots of questions about that after the year end. Are you happy for me to start with that one, Kian? Yeah, sure, yeah. 
One of the things I find really useful is if the practice managers um, keep a list so they know what income they have claimed for, they know when it should be received or when it's coming in. So if they can keep a list and they, um, they'll know if it's not being received at the year end, but if it for income it, it refers to up to 31st of March, for example. So if we've got a list, we know what to bring in. Another useful method is we usually ask for, just as with the bank statements, but with the health board statements, two months post year end, and even if they can highlight on those, what income refers to the accounting period that we are working with. In terms of creditors, either giving us a list of invoices that have been received but not paid at the year end is really useful. Or again, even just a written list of the things that they know that they're due to pay. Kian? Yeah, no, I think that makes sense from my end. And, and as you say, with, with creditors, hopefully they're they're probably the easy ones. Because for instance, if you if you receive an invoice, you know, it's come through the post and you receive it on the first or second of April. And James, the example, well, you're not going to have paid them. So they're definitely going to need to be on your list. Um, and you know, the, the state statements, monthly uh, GMS, PMS statements is, yeah, a lot of the time they do contain details of which months they relate to, but there's also quite a number of items which don't, and often we're, you know, scratching our heads over which, which items should be included or not. So yeah, you know, Elaine's tip of highlighting it would, would be really, really useful for us, I think. Yeah, and there's a couple of other items, particularly in England. So Elaine, you're kind of immune from these this <laughs> part of the conversation, I guess. But superannuation doesn't always get taken um, by the year end. Some of it by just by design. You know, you put an estimate in as you go for, for pension contributions for the GP partners, and you don't know until you do the certificates what the final liability is, which then gets mopped up the following year. So that's always going to be a creditor or debtor. But otherwise, with PCSE capita, sometimes, you know, money doesn't always get taken when it should do levers and joiners and so on um so that's one part of it and also pcn surpluses i know kieran that you're keen to talk about that as well so yeah superannuation shortfalls and pcn surpluses are often something that happens as part of the accounting process did you just want to cover that part kieran for england yeah sure so for so everyone will know about pcns they've been in place for about well, pretty much two years as it stands now. And I think the sort of the common themes across what we've been seeing with our clients is, you know, we, we prepare the accounts as normal based on the records as normal. And there's just these payments received either from PCN, uh, you know, like a, a lead PCN practice or direct from the NHS, depending on, uh, you know, where the money's coming from. Um, but the important thing is, you know we see those payments but we don't necessarily know whether they relate to the right period whether you're owed anything else and you know to I think to make our lives a little bit easier appreciating the stress and strains that's going around in the, the NHS at the minute is if you know if you have details spreadsheets that have been prepared by the PCN if you've got PCN accounts that are being prepared by another practice accountant then you know make that on your list of things to send through along with the other records because uh, we're, we're seeing that the lack of PCN information can sort of hold up the accounts process and it may mean that your accountant is providing you with a set of accounts at a meeting which are subject to change and could be a couple of months before they're finalised so yeah I, I guess my tips on that would be getting getting early try and provide us with the numbers as soon as you can and yeah it should make for a much more accurate set of accounts. Yeah thanks Kevin so like I say Elaine you're immune from that bit in terms of um, PCNs and so on up in Scotland but for the next part, I'll, I'll aim this question at you, Elaine, really. So when you once we've arrived at a profit figure for the accounts, the next thing that needs to be done is to allocate it amongst the partners. Now, partners come and go, but also they change their sessions now and again. Um, there might also be pre-allocated items, like not all of the GPs might own the property, so not be allocated the rent, or some may do the training, so get the training grants pre-allocated to them. What's the best way that practices can keep track of those changes? Because we will inevitably ask them at the end of the year as accountants what they are. Um, any tips there for practices? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we usually ask our practices certainly to if there's partnership changes, be it sessions or partners coming in or leaving the practice to email us when that happens, because we then got a record on the system and we have it there already for the year end accounts. But the other thing the practice manager can do is, again, just keep a list. So if they keep a note of all sessional changes, all um, partnership changes, and then give that to us at the year end with the records, then that is a massive help because there's nothing worse than preparing a set of accounts and then 
you notice there's been a sessional change, you're told there's been a sessional change and everything changes again. In terms of the prior allocations, again, it is very much if the practice manager can highlight to us when they know that there's specific items of income or expenditure that should be applied to specific partners. Because if we don't know about those, we can sometimes pick it up through the drawings. If there's been an additional payment one month or um, there's been a reduction in the drawings, for instance, but it's always easier if a list is given to us because then we know we're allocating the correct amount to the correct partner. Yeah, anything to add to that, Kieran? Thank you, Elaine. Um, no, I don't think so. I think that list is really important. As Elaine said, drawings, you know, you can pick those up through through the drawings. But yeah, it, it's really, if, if payments haven't been made out to partners, then, you know, we wouldn't be to know uh, if anything in the, in the accounts does relate to them. So yeah, you know, often practices have different arrangements and things. So yeah, just sort of being uh, upfront with it, just letting us know, and then we can factor that in. Um, and especially on the, the sessions point that Elaine covered is if you've got a small small practice with a small number of sessions, if you get that wrong for you know one even one session out for a period of a few months, that can make quite a substantial difference on on profits, and and it may mean a meeting which you're presenting or we're presenting accounts and profit figures may have to change substantially. So yeah, that's one of the, I'd say that's probably one of the most or is the most important aspect of us preparing accounts is just getting the profit share and ratios right. Yeah, and staying on that topic again, not all partners will leave or join at the year end date. So again, if we use March as an example, not everybody's got a March year end, but if you use March, you might get people joining halfway through a year, which is no real problem. But one question that we sometimes get asked by clients is, um, should we do an interim set? You know, somebody joins halfway through six months through a year, should we do a half year set so that they get their accurate profit share? What, what are your thoughts? On, on that topic because sometimes it could be right sometimes it may not be right i would say in the majority of cases it's not needed i think it the benefit does not outweigh the cost of doing this i think if you've got very clear allocations of how the income should be split if you've got the correct profit shares then you can um, use just the year-end accounts and that gives you the correct split where it can be harder is when a partner perhaps retires and they're looking to pay out the final balance and things like that. And if there has been, for instance, flu money that's been earned, um, if in your example, a March year end, it could be that a partner starts in the July and they've not been there for the flu that's been done. So should they be picking up a share of that? But if you're keeping good notes of what the prior allocation should be, then you should still be able to just use your year end accounts. And the other point I would say, and it is coming back to cloud based accounting, that helps as well, because if you've got good cloud based records, it lets you see the results as you go throughout the year. So, again, negates more the need for interim accounts would be my opinion. <laughs> Yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah, definitely. Sometimes we have had in the past disputes which happen and just for uh, avoidance of ambiguity and, and later sort of discussions, we have prepared interim sets, but it is the exception rather than the rule, as you say, you know, if you do accounts over the course of the year, but if there is something specific that needs pre-allocating and for good reason, or if it's covered in the partnership agreement, which says that certain things should be pre-allocated, for example, then um, yeah, not doing interim accounts is probably best way to go and it keeps costs down as well because we don't want to charge extra for doing a set of accounts which really serves no extra purpose um so the other thing that i was just thinking of as well as part of the accounts we've gone through bookkeeping we've gone through year end cut off with that items that straddle the year end profit allocations levers and joiners the other thing that we'll always ask is personal expenses for the gps um which for some people, they may have been keeping it as they've been going along through the year. Others then have to backtrack and, and look back over the course of the year. So conscious that most of the people watching this video with be, will be practice managers. Is there anything that they can encourage their GPs to do in terms of keeping track of their personal expenses and, in fact, other tax information? Um, any thoughts on that, Kieran? Um, constant pestering, I would say, for practice managers, for um, GPs and their personal expenses. Um, you know, it may be one of those things that you don't necessarily think is that important. You go, well, we don't really need to pass it in until we do your tax return. But as James mentioned earlier, um, you know, certificates for uh, you know, pensions, they, they won't be completed and prepared until almost a year. You know, if you've got a March year and almost a year after the accounts and to make sure the accounts are correct, presented, you know, fairly and current accounts are 
reflecting any arrears of contributions is we want to make a really good estimate of what those uh, additional contributions may be so including personal expenses you know if you've had an exceptional year and uh, of expenses and, and say they're eight thousand and last year they were three thousand well that's going to make a big difference in your pension profit and so yeah not including those may result in ups and downs um catch-ups in future years for your for your pension contributions really and tax information elaine keeping on top of that you know bank interest and so on Absolutely. Again, it's keep a record of it. We're going to ask for the same information each year and the tax deadlines are always the same. So if you could just please, when you, the request for information is sent, either at that point collate everything and get it submitted as soon as you can, or have a rolling file that you're keeping everything together. So at the end of the tax year, you can just hand it over. It doesn't just make our life easier. I promise it can make your life easier as well, because the amount of clients that I hear say, I wish that I'd just done it. Um, it wasn't actually that bad when they came to pull together the information. Um, I'd be a millionaire if I took money off them for every time they said that. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So a couple of other things with um, with the personal expenses last year, where the people were working from home a lot more, performing remote consultations, etc. There are additional allowances potentially available there, and also mileage percentages may have changed last year just because fewer. Um, business miles as it were and, and less commuting and so on so just happen to be cognizant of that so thank you Kieran and Elaine that's been great um, hope that's been useful to everybody watching this look forward to seeing you on another practice index topic soon thanks